things fall apart. Whoops. The second coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body in the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Welcome to the Regeneration Podcast. My name is Mike Sauter. And I'm with my friend who just read a poem, Michael Martin. Michael Martin, can you tell people the, the name and the author of that poem? Familiar uh, to many. Yeah, yeah it's uh, The Second Coming by William Butler Yeats, probably one of the most important and most amazing poems of the 20th century. No and, doubt. And, and in fact, the, the edition of this book I have, I, I, I had to dig it out before. It's... The Collected Poems of William Butler Yeats from, what year is it? Uh, 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 uh. 1938. You're saying it's a... And that was edition? actually, this was a, this is reprinted. It was originally yeah. came out in 33, but I got the 38 edition, which is a, a year before he died. And what did I pay for it? Six dollars and fifty cents. How about that? It has that pencil six and then it just line after it. Yeah. It's, That's a beautiful probably, little image. Well, probably before I had kids, so 35 years ago, probably. Talk about talk about things that are going to be missed unless we do our job of preservation. Well, I know. That's that's you know, I've been hoarding books. I've been I've been on uh what do they call that? Thriftbooks.com. Yeah. I've been ordering stuff almost every day. Me too. <laughs> Getting stuff because I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm yeah. going to, I'm loading up on groceries and books. Tell, tell our friends, uh, you know, I was going to ask you about your garden, but uh, you're, you're an agriculturalist, you're a farmer. And tell people how many kids you have in your family and where you live, Michael. I have nine, ch nine children. Uh, the eldest is 32. The youngest is 11. And uh, six, six boys, three girls. And we live in uh, Jackson County, Michigan, a little okay little town called Waterloo yeah. and uh, we have a 10 acre farm biodynamic farm where we raise uh, cows bees got a couple of sheep we'll be I'm sure we'll be getting pigs before too long we, we, we usually do pigs and we do a, a market garden or a CSA awesome so so my wife and it's been a long day so it's been really hot too I don't know about what it is there but it hit uh, 86 today. Yeah, the, not as much humidity as we might have a few weeks from now, but mid-80s yeah. here. I'm in upstate New York, south of Rochester, the Finger Lakes region. Uh, yeah. Not quite as many kids. I've got four, two and two, uh, all mm -hmm. between 21 and 26. And uh, I can do my part with a very large vegetable garden, but not on much acreage. Live it out in the country, but a, a third of an acre, chock mm -hmm. full with uh, vegetables and chickens. And we used to have goats even on that third of an acre. So you can do a lot with a little. And yeah, well, that's our last place was two acres and half of it was pond and woods. And okay, we had we had a lot of stuff. I think and I was at your place right after not maybe the year you moved to the new farm. Is that right? It was the summer we moved. It was the summer we moved in September and the conference was the following July. So wild. Only Michael Martin, folks, yeah. <laughs> who's a doer, would have a conference at his house the year he moves. And my, uh, the, that day it was kind of if right the whole week leading up to it my wife kept saying are you sure these are going to be nice people because yeah. you only met them on the internet you don't know what's going on <laughs> <laughs> imagine other people nice. taking they that seem risk. like they're gonna be nice yeah speaking of people who we've met on the internet you know um introduce today's guest tara thiki uh 
we, we were chatting recently and we, um, we agreed. Tara, Michael Martin, and myself, Mike Sauter, we all drank from the same Kool-Aid cup at some point because the way we met is Michael Martin wrote a book called Transfiguration. I wrote a review at frontporchrepublic.com and uh, Tara commented on my review and she would think she got Michael Martin. She thought I got him. And then I read her comment and I thought she gets it, whatever that means. Maybe we'll unpack that today. Tara Dickey, welcome. Uh, tell people about yourself, where you're from, your life and things. I know you have children as well. I do. Um, I wish I had nine, but so far I'm like you. I've had four in about five and a half years. Same thing, yeah. So I'm in the thick of it because my youngest is about one year old. Congratulations. Um, my, my third youngest today was enjoying the beautiful weather and oh. threw her to celebrate through her clothes out the car window. Say around. more, say more. <laughs> we, were, it's just, it's, we all experience, it hasn't happened to me in a while. I remember things like that, but it wasn't today. We unfortunately can't garden as much as we like because we, my husband works in the city. So we have to live near the city, but we try to go to the country as much as possible. So we have a place where the kids get some uh, supplemental schooling and it was a beautiful day and we rolled down the windows and there were cows and horses and my kids were so charmed. I noticed my, uh, my toddler, who's very forceful, had lost some clothing. And when we came home, I said, where's your shirt? And she said, I, I threw it away. I, said, where are <laughs> I, I threw it away. And I thought, what, well, where on the floor, where are you talking about? And then my four-year-old says, no, she threw them out the window. And I went, oh, <laughs> Well, I guess it's good to be alive on a beautiful, yeah. <laughs> beautiful sunny day. <laughs> yeah. And you live in Western PA. Right? Western PA, about 25 minutes from downtown Pittsburgh. That's great. That's great. And I was uh, very happy this weekend because my, my dad was up visiting me and he pulled out of his, uh, his work sack, Transfiguration. Did he? And said, I'm rereading it, Tara. He's like, I love this guy. And I was like, I wow. know it. <laughs> He's again, no I, see it, I see it, that book is kind of a blueprint what, uh, for what Michael and I are out to do. You know, again, let's talk, about, let's talk about a sacramental world, but let's talk about the economy. Let's talk about our homes. Let's talk about parenting. Let's talk about growing things. Let's talk about nature, being connected to the real, right? That's the whole deal. And that's why, again, that's a short book, but it did map something out, Michael. I hope you're aware of that. <laughs> Um, but actually that book came out of the conference we did. Yeah. Awesome. It what definitely did it that was, and Jesus, the imagination. Yeah. It was so packed full of living in the world. I was like, this is what I'm trying to see. And it's not theoretical. It's not preachy. It's just, this is what we can do right here, right now. Yeah. And I was very excited about that. Michael's a doer, if nothing else. Well, I don't, I don't like to. Just talk about stuff. <laughs> a lot of people like talking about not doing things. I mean, about doing things and just again. Yeah. Uh, but that's why you're quite singular in that. Let me tell people too that um, something I've said, and it, it could be cliche because I've, I've talked to Tara several times, but, um, you know, she was really uh, maybe the reason I joined Twitter because being busy Sorry. Being busy, I had I I think somehow somebody must have referenced something you tweeted about, so I looked it up on Google, and it was great. And I realized the first tweet thread, maybe it was four, that I realized that Tara says more in a tweet than I've ever said in an essay, and I just mean it. That's completely. right. Yeah, and uh, so then I joined Twitter, and uh, I I always I don't want to throw this on you, Tara, but it seemed you know you're busy, you're a mom. That that was probably the medium that you had to choose during that time. You know, how about? At almost like diving into the conversation because this could go anywhere with the three of us but like tell us about that and tell us about your experience and you're recently off twitter even say something about that well i you know i love twitter i have to say that i'm taking so a break good at it yeah, yeah i'm taking a break right now only because i you know my kids are at such precarious ages and i really i have so many books i want to read and i want to concentrate but twitter is a gift to people looking to connect and people who are struggling with the incredible atomization. Um, I think both of you are familiar with Rudolf Steiner. And I, I do believe that the way forward is not back. That's but a I huge thing. Say it again I, in a different way. The way forward is not back. Yeah. The way forward is not back. And I, I, I read that line once in an Iris Murdoch book, and it really struck me. And I'm 
I've been struggling with what that means because I do believe in eternal truths, but I also believe that, <laughs> that, that there has to be something redemptive and something worthy of saving in what we're doing. So I, I like to find something good in Twitter, but it's also hard. Um, as a mom with young kids, it's so lonely. It's, I'm not on Facebook anymore. It's very hard to find mom groups and people in the same situation as you. My block either way is just retirees. Okay. Um, I think there's maybe one kid, like one block over and another kid a block back there, but they are... They're, they're just never around. There's no play. It's nothing like what I grew up with, especially like what my parents grew up with. Mm -hmm. And so when you're trying to talk to people and map out this new world, Twitter is a great place for doing that. But it obviously can't be the end. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a stepping stone and there is a real risk in using the stepping stone. Is it the ring? Is it Frodo, <laughs> <laughs> Sauron's ring? Is the ring capable of redemption? Or is the ring just the the path to the hive mind. I don't know. It's what led me to you guys. So I'm happy, but I'm also very wary of what it means. And you're recently off and you, at least temporarily you say, yeah. Yeah. I was reading, I, you know, I, I was reading a, you're going to laugh at me, but I was reading a Dean Koontz book. My, okay. my dad right. recommended right. me, yeah. and he said, he said, I want you to read this. It's something lighthearted. I'm not lighthearted, but it was fast. And I was like, well, I've given you so many books to read, so I'll read some of this. He was like, it's anti-transhumanism. And there was a line about Elon Musk. Really? And the Twitter hive mind. And he had just purchased uh, Twitter. This The book was written before he purchased Twitter. And I thought, wow, an internal Twitter, what does that mean? Like, I already can feel Twitter in my head all day. When I'm washing the dishes, when I'm doing something with my kids, I can hear the discourse in my head. Do I, do I want that? What does that mean? And what does it mean that this man who believes in neurochipping just bought Twitter? And then someone else on Twitter had recommended a book where she talked about a 60 day fast from Facebook and how she could feel the air and breathe again. And I thought maybe this is a wonderful time to take a little break because St. John's Day was in just, just a little under 60 days. And I thought, I really want to be living by the seasons and the solstices and the equinoxes. And so let's take a step back and breathe and try to wake up with the sun and read physical books and not just be caught up in the discourse and what that is in my head. Yeah. I, I never, Michael's on Twitter. You can tell people what your handle is, Mike. What is it? <laughs> it's it's the sociologist. Yeah, I like your Twitter presence. Michael's combative. It's great. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you know, Therese Schroeder Schieker. We're gonna yeah. interview her eventually. Yeah, she always tells me every time I see that Michael Collins movie poster, I think of you. you know, <laughs> the, 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 where he's fire giving us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I, I there's just uh, something about the uh, this Irishness in me. <laughs> yeah, just. Just picking it, was a fight, so right? it was so great when you got on Twitter, though. I felt like, oh, I needed, I needed you to be on here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, let's, I, I got, I'm like Mike, I, I moved to Twitter because the people I liked on Facebook had left. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing, you know, Facebook is much worse with, uh, with uh, censorship than Twitter. Is Twitter is bad enough, but Twitter doesn't censor people with, you know few hundred or few thousand followers but <laughs> but they do i mean it facebook they don't care no you're They're, constantly getting it yeah i also didn't uh, i've i don't think i've ever tweeted i set up one i wanted to get john cooper powies we'll talk about him more time at another podcast but he's, he's so quotable and i think he's a writer for our times but i set up an account that someday i will use as one of these quotes from him thing should maybe five but uh as far as tweeting for myself I just, it's what you said, Tara. I just, I just knew right away. Um, and maybe it's the blessings of age that before you get into something, I knew it would probably be a bad thing for me. I'd start thinking in tweets uh, a lot, a lot. And so I just haven't done it. It's, that's a good decision because I hate that I do now. I just think, oh, something's happened. Well, what do I want to say about that rather than entering into that? Uh -huh. And my whole point on Twitter, as you know, is communion is entering into something, not 
trying to capture it in a tweet. So. Yeah. Well, we're going to tell people more about your Substack. Like we'll, we'll mention the title at some point, but you know, um, Michael and I, again, so grateful to have you on. We thought because we could talk for hours and hours <laughs> that we would focus today on uh, two pieces. One very recent. Um, it's today, but uh, the first one was uh, an article in the American Mind on October 19th, 2021, called Selling the Female Body for Parts. Um, and the other one is a substack that I saw first today, I think it was published this morning, mm -hmm. Mothering in the Age of the Borg. There's a lot of overlap mm -hmm. uh, between them. There's so much in both, but I think that gives us plenty to talk about. Uh, yeah. Michael and Martin, you tell me. Oh, you get, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I, I'm just blown away. I was just blown away by that because uh, Mike sent me the the one from last year, this week, and I don't, I don't know why, why, how I hadn't seen it, and I was totally stoked about that one. And then your other one drops this morning, and Mike texted me even before I opened up my email, and there it was. And this, I mean, that's that's it. It's and I, it, you know, you you nailed it because what's going on right now. And I think it's the, I called it the, this, the, the real war against women. Mm -hmm. And it's right here. And, and it's really, um, and it's part and parcel in with, of, with transhumanism, which is, you know, and, it, and, and like you say, in, in the one from this morning, you know, it's not happening to the men. This, this is a, a, a an attack on women. Not it, men aren't affected by this. No one's defining men here. <laughs> it's just women. Mm -hmm. You said and, and I, I hadn't thought of it so clearly, Tara. Yeah. yeah. And I see this with my students, you know, because I have a lot of female students who are there on, you know, soccer scholarships or whatever. And this is a real issue for them. When all of a sudden you have some transgendered person is going to start, is going to take their spot on the team, right? That's a that's a real real life problem for these women, and and I and I noticed it um, probably at the beginning of 2020, right around when COVID hit. That was it was already something that they were concerned about, and and it's been interesting to talk to them over the last couple of years about the 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 things they're dealing with. I mean, it, you go to college trying to figure out who you are. Now you have to figure out <laughs> what your gender is at the same time, which is a, uh, it's, it's very Philip K. Dick. <laughs> We've mentioned Dean Koontz and Philip K. Dick. We'll be mentioning Tolkien. <laughs> go Tara. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm trying to hold that Iris Murdoch principle of the ways forward, not back. So you know, there's a there's a long story as you both know about enclosure and industrialization and the the pulling the man out of the home and in that world of the 1950s you know where the woman's alone with all this technology then empowerment makes a kind of sense but the way has to be forward not not back in in that sense but what they're doing is dissolving everything. And they're especially dissolving the feminine. The masculine stays. The masculine was pulled out of the home. The farmer was turned into the office worker. And that is the ideal that's held up now to women is just power, power. And the, the female attributes of the body of nurturing, of warmth, of life-giving, those are diminished, they're disrespected. And that is an incredible struggle for women. They're not allowed to name the struggle. They're not allowed to admit to the, the guilt and the pains of it. They have a very limited lexicon of how they can frame this problem. Um, I'm not sure if either of you or if, if both of you have read Ivan Illich's Gender. Honestly, I like 15 times for myself. <laughs> I just, it's just, it's how I spend my, it's how I spend my 20s is reading everything by him multiple times. And you should be talking about this, not No, me. no, no. It's been a <laughs> while, yeah. I'll give you my, sp I, I think it's a good, we can, maybe we can't go back. I, but there's something back there that needs to be preserved. 
and uplifted. And the, why I love the name of this podcast, Regeneration, Renewal. It's not about discarding it, but about uplifting it through this struggle. And I think Illich gives us the framework for what we need to be preserving, vernacular, this folk understanding, this non top down, but this bottom up understanding of what it is to be male and female. And that involves our bodies mm -hmm. and what is being dictated to us right now, but how to re-perceive our bodies as molecular genomics, as reductionists, as interchangeable parts, which is why it's incredibly noteworthy that we're about to look at one of the first, oh, they, I don't know how many attempts there have been in the past, but a renewed attempt to transplant a uterus into a man. And obviously knowing the endocrine system and all the things that go into giving birth, this is wild. This is quite a claim to, to remap every inch of the human body by seeing it as solely like a car. You know, we can just put in a new transmission and here we go. Um, can, a, can a Toyota have a Rolls Royce? I don't know. Um, so I think Ivan, Ivan Illich sort of gives us a good groundwork, a good framework to going forward, but there's a lot of work to do. Yeah, and I, I'll try and give our listeners maybe a short framework of what he's doing in that book, part of it, as you know. <laughs> uh, but like, he'll say that, you know, prior to, uh, in one sense, modern times, prior to the industrial mode of production, or we might envision for ourselves a factory line. I used to work in a, a factory, it's called Century Safes in East Rochester, New York. You know, that type where you just, I was one member on a line, you know, I would scrape the cement off these fireproof safes. The person next to me would add a widget to them, a male and female. But he said prior to that, that way of doing organized production, uh, every job, if you looked at an Alpine, the Alpine mountains, you had all these villages, you could go from village to village and the tool might be different in each toolbox, but there was a line that ran through the toolbox that kind of separated. And we might find that line to modern sensibilities too rigid. And I think it could be too rigid possibly, but I didn't live then. But there was a line that ran through the toolbox. And so um, women in one village might milk their goats, but they would never milk the cow. That was man's work. And women uh, would do this job, but not another job. Or it could be the same job with different tools. But there was this wiggly waggly line that ran through. And so we think, okay, that's, you know, we had to overcome that. But I have a personal anecdote you know, that says no. So you're saying we have to move forward. Um, do we need to restore those hard divisions? Probably not, but we're, we're talking about poetry, if you ask me, more than we are talking about a top-down machine-like construction. But in my early marriage, my wife and I lived in an apartment with, uh, there was five apartments in this nice building in Rochester. It was associated with uh, where I was studying, uh, just getting into MA in theology. But you could hear everybody and we're all raising kids. It was a blast. We're still friends with some of them. But my wife early on, we tried to set up a gendered, a gendered role in our little apartment that, um, you know, that I would cook the meat, but she would probably make the casseroles. Any grilling I did, but she would make this. Furthermore, um, she probably changed more diapers than I did, but she could ask me to do it. But how was that different from other people or why were we grateful for it? Because you could hear arguments in the other apartments saying, I did the last load of laundry, it's your turn. I changed the last diaper, it's your turn. And it's what Illich called the rests of gender, R-E-S-T-S. -E that it was just serene. There was a whole half of my life I didn't have to worry about. And one more anecdote, because my wife gets a kick out of it. Maybe she'll listen to this. But um, she, we had relatives coming over. I, we got a new, I think it was a Kirby, like vacuum cleaner or something. And uh, we had gone through a bunch, but we had some relatives coming over. And I think she probably does the vacuuming, but she asked me to vacuum. Oh, sure. But she saw me fiddling with the thing and it was new. And I said the phrase, how do you fire this bad boy up? And she got <laughs> so pissed, right? Like, that I never <laughs> used a vacuum cleaner. And I took it on the chin and she told every subsequent guest at any party we had for the following year that anecdote. But I can also remind her that if, if she had to like turn on the grill or fire up the mower, she would have no idea. And we both <laughs> agree that that's a fine thing we do, you know. Uh, end of story. Um, well, I, I think this is where Michael Martin should be coming in shortly with sociology in particular. But before he does, I just 
want to say that I, I really <laughs> respond to that. Like no one in my house vacuums, but me, mm-hmm. no one's allowed to do the laundry, but me. And my husband likes to bake. So I think that's one of those interesting areas where you sort of find something. It doesn't have to be a hard line. It it doesn't have to be what everybody does, but Mm -hmm. he likes the chemistry of baking. And I Mm -hmm. have so many other things to do that I say, oh, thank God, please bake the birthday cake. Like I want someone else to do it. Yeah. And it's a happy division. and, And he likes to do, I don't, I used to be a vegetarian. I'm, I'm still mostly vegetarian. I like him to touch the fish and the meat mm-hmm. and I do everything else in the kitchen so he can bake and touch the meat, but he does have that one feminine thing. The do you think this Tara gets a little bit to that moving forward piece or no, you know? Oh, I think so. I think, I think, I think everybody's looking for a little less work or a little less things they have to cloud their mind. I really- we never have to think about it. He never has to think about his clothes. Yeah. I never have to think about the birthday cake. That's, totally taken care of yeah you know i'll bake bread occasionally because I, I love baking bread yeah at a later time illich would say the the women's work that came in could be seen as like more drudgery i guess but it wasn't this gender line wasn't based on good jobs or bad jobs there's just a division yes certainly some of the men's jobs were further away from the home and so forth but we can't retroactively throw back on that like that women always had the worst work and men had the good work but that and that's the point that Elich is making is yeah. that n- nobody thought about it as drudgery then no right? <laughs> i didn't know it was drudgery until somebody told me it was yeah, right? right right that right. it's inferior work to the other uh, kind yeah i mean i mean i mean how many how many things do i do in the course of a day and the way bonnie and i we kind of i think at this point in our relationship we've been married for 30 years we kind of organically divide responsibilities Mm -hmm. and I think even with the farm this year I mean it's always every year is different she tends to uh do more of the planting than I do I mean she does she runs the greenhouse I don't do anything in the greenhouse she does but I do a lot more with the animals and with forming beds and plus you know we uh we sold a bunch of trees over the over the winter and I'm still in the process of cutting up the tops for firewood. That's not a job she's gonna do. Mm-hmm. You know. So I do it and I my two youngest sons help me. <laughs> Which is she she told me though that if you were to birth children uh eleven and twelve, that you would be doing the next birthing though. That's right. Well I'm gonna get one of those plastic, <laughs> you know, chest things like like Mayor Pete has. <laughs> Why, why does this fight come in? Because it's the same way with me, Michael. Like I, without even thinking about it, my husband does the weed whacking. I pick out plants to buy. He digs the hole, but then I water them. Like there's no arguing about it. There's not even much talking about it. Like it's just how we, the heavier labor parts are his, the nur- the ongoing nurturing is mine. Like now let's call it in addition to the rests of gender, like the serenity we have, that there's a lot of things we don't have to worry about. Remember, he also used the word the dance of gender. And I think, again, that's a moving forward. I, young people, you know, I teach, I've been in campus ministry for 20 plus years. I've taught at the college. I've, t- I've taught in high school. Um, they're hungry for that. You know, anything that anything that's poetic in life. So the dance of gender, you know, you're going to love a, a world that's not top down, um, you know, uh, what Christopher Lash, that social critic, called the rationalization of everyday life, right? Where everything has to be recreated in the vision of science. We look at it scientifically, yeah. then we... Well, then and we politically. politically. Yeah. I mean, politically. Scientifically and politically. Everything's Amen. infected with politics. Mm-hmm. And so we, we are not allowed to respond to the world in an authentic way. Right. We have we have this monitor sitting at our shoulders saying, ah, 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 or what what Tom Berg and other people call an egregore, right? Which it yeah. really is, it's a demo, kind of a demonic presence. Uh, an egregore is, according to the literature, a kind of uh, group soul generated by a group. I mean, if you want to experience one, go into the, to an English department <laughs> and there are some things you know you're not supposed to say that I said yeah. anyway. It kind um, of works like a Frankenstein monster. Like we make it, it does. we create it, then it comes to own it. It's us. a golem, it's a golem, yeah. 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 And, and and that's i mean i think our culture at large is infected by that right now yeah you know 
I mean, I think cancel culture is not, is a symptom of it. You know, it's, it's cancel culture doesn't cause anything. It's a symptom of a, of, of a deeper, deeper spiritual dysfunction, which I would even call an egregore, right? I mean, it's a perfect example. And I think uh, there is a, a bit of Rene Girard's idea of the scapegoat in there too, right? And, and where, well, we need blood. We need somebody's blood and we'll destroy your career and your, and your life. Well, you're seeing right now, I think, with uh, people trying to, to intimidate the Supreme Court justices, right? They, unless there's blood, they won't be happy. And then when there is blood, it, it, it'll satisfy the populace for a little while. But then that the scapegoat mechanism starts to churn up again. And then they're looking for, for a new victim. So how do we guide young people like this sort of dance that we've all found in our lives? How do you, I mean, 20, 30 years ago, maybe you wouldn't need to advise people on this, but we're looking at young people who are drowning. I mean, a mental health crisis, a, a, bio, a biological identification crisis with what, like, how many young people identifying as non-binary? How do you, how do we give people a roadmap to this? And, and off the top of my head, um, Michael Souter, the way you said, you know, the dance, mm -hmm. to me, it sort of feels like swimming. Like there are certain movements that come natural when you're moving in the water. And I can only tell people to listen to your bodies. My husband's body's stronger. I have a lot of stamina, the endurance to give birth and the endurance to just come out and water the plants every day. The sort of nagging quality of the housewife was the, where the sweet potatoes watered today. <laughs> like that's a, that's being in touch with your biological water. Mm -hmm. is, is that, Good... Well, how about how about this distinction only to get at it, you know, because um, I'm a walking you mentioned the mental health crisis of young adults I'm a, I'm a never in my life have I been a creature of one thing but I'm basically a walking creature of the mental health crisis of young adults right now. It's on my mind all the time, but the, um, you know, one we could say that what we're talking about, as opposed to the pills, as opposed to vaccines and or the latest one which is actually just a shot, um, or you know that this can lead to it. But I also just thinking out loud here, you know, that when we talked about this dance of genders, we all made reference to like washing machines and so forth. But all of us, I think if I was listening right, about 80% of what we were alluding to had something to do with the soil. And I wonder again, because we're looking for a miracle, possibly the crisis is so bad. Is there a healing in the soil? Is there a healing in the dirt? Um, that like, if we could get people these problems, some of this stuff might vanish if they were working. At the abbey where I ran the retreat houses, the abbot there, he's from India. But I remember being in a, uh, bringing some youth over there and just uh, almost by the way of nothing, the, the subject of modern anxiety came up and uh, the abbot and another monk, they couldn't believe what they were hearing. It was so foreign to them. And one monk, uh, in answer to the question, like, what do I do about it? They said, oh, he kind of mentioned the body. They said, oh, all of a sudden your body will just shut down and you'll have to do something about it. You know, you'll just collapse. But the abbot who was from India said, you know, you're going to have to do something to work against the grain to inhabit your body. You know, it was new to him. He hadn't heard of this stuff. And he wasn't talking about transgenderism. He was talking about anxiety. And he said, like, so put, do, do something to work against the grain. Put a shovel in dirt. And the abbot himself does not tend the soil. He's got a lot of other responsibilities. He could, but he, I, that's, that's always stayed with me. So something against the grain, but also again, the, the dirt comes up there every time. When we collapse, where are we falling? We're falling into the ground, the dirt, when we physically fall, and again, to work against the grain. But uh, I see our farmer. Is well, well, that's, well, that's one of the things Rudolf Steiner said, you know, yeah. even to people who were doing, being Waldorf teachers or whatever, he'd, he'd say, okay, do three, maybe five years of the intellectual stuff, but then you got to get grounded again. Mm. You have to touch the soil. Yeah. Uh, in fact, remember, uh, Jeremy Nadler wrote a great article for Jesus the Imagination called uh, Touching the Earth. It was great. Which is, and I think he, 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 Jeremy Nadler is a gardener. He's a phenomenal philosopher and, and, and gardener. Um, so that's part of it. But, and I think what I'm noticing with, with 
because sometimes I invite the students to the farm for our festivals. And one time they came from Michaelmas, some of them, and they, were, they were like, this is the best thing ever. Because the other thing that they crave is not only a connection to the soil and to, to the real, the physical real, but to the cosmological real. No, so remember, Mike, we were talking about your, your son's got a lot of friends who are interested in astrology. I'm going to write an article about that phenomenon. Tara, if you didn't know, like every uh, young girl ages 14 to 23 knows more about astrology than any astrologist did in our childhood. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in my 30s, but uh, I'm still a millennial. Yeah, so. okay, great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, know. I feel like uh, my... I grew up with astrology and um, I feel like I was a gateway drug to many young millennial women. So I'm very, right. very ashamed. And yet I also still believe in cos cosmology. Sure, so. it's, a, it's a great, no, I think uh, even astrology is great. We don't even have to water it down. Again, there's bad, good and bad uses, but there's good and bad uses of the sacraments of the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. There's good and bad uses of the invocations of the saints, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know? um, and and so, so I, I, that's why I think, you know, what I, what I've, what I see that young people hunger for is this connection to the, not only to the soil, but into, into something cosmological. In fact, I had a course here two weeks ago, almost two weeks ago on uh, biodynamic gardening and farming as Christian path. And one of the exercises I had people do, we want, so the, the evening lecture was at seven o'clock. So eight fifteen, eight thirty. we go outside. I said, okay, this, there's West. Where's the sun right now? And most of them had a decent idea of where the sun is. I said, okay, where's the moon? And even uh, oh, uh, one of my friends who's really in touch with nature, he couldn't tell me. He had no idea what phase the moon was in or where it was in relationship to the sun. And I told him, I said, you know, you can get these apps for your phone that show you where the planets are. And I have one on my phone. It came, actually great. came with my yeah. phone. And I said, so I would three times a day, you know, just if you, whenever you think about it, think, okay, there's the sun. Where's the moon? And, you know, guess, and then check yourself with, with your app or whatever. And then you can start to expand to the other planets. Um, it's amazing because now this is a big part of biodynamic farming is knowing where the moon is because where, where the moon is dependent uh, influences what part of the plant you'll be, you, you want to favor when you're planting. So for instance, if the moon is in a water sign, you want to plant uh, leaf vegetables or, or vegetables that you will use the, primarily the leaves for. Um, if, if uh, the moon's in a, sun, in a fire sign, you're looking for, for fruit, fruit vegetables. So we're really attentive to that. I mean, of course, right now we're, we're at, we're at hurry up and get it in phase. So we're, <laughs> we're skipping some of the rules right now, but in that's general- That's actually what we're, we're talking watching. about. Yeah, but that's a great, like when we talked about gender, right? We're not making a fetish out of something, but yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's a great example. We're not dogmatic about it, but but we try to keep keep aware of where things are. Prudent. And if you, but in, you say you can, forward is go, not going back, you know, but there is a lot we lost as humanity in our connection to these things, which it's not only connection to the soil and to the, um, the cosmos and the planting cycle, but it's, it's the connection to the church year, which used to be intimately connected and acknowledged to be connected to that cycle. Right. And I noticed when I, when I talk to my students about this stuff, so, so for instance, I, I taught a course on romanticism last semester and so I would talk about enclosure. We did, you know, John Clare and uh, Robert Burns. And we, we would talk about, you know, the relationship to the romantic, romantics to nature. And, and there would be things about, uh, we would talk about maypoles and, and things like this, that, that how the romantics looked back to the Middle Ages, as in, even Novalis, uh, looked back to the Middle Ages as, as this time when society just about had it right. And I think Ruskin, you know, I, I just ordered a book by Ruskin, uh, John Ruskin, the, the art critic, where he too, and the, the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, right? They were looking, they, they wanted to, to retrieve something was, that was lost while not, you know, be going retrograde into the past. 
and that and I, and I think this is what Rudolf Steiner was doing as well. You know, he was trying to to give new life to the Christian festivals, right? Unfortunately, he left it in the hands of anthroposophists who don't who just want to keep it to themselves. <laughs> That'll be a thing moving forward. Well, they just want to keep it to themselves, you know. And when we start, when we bought this farm, we said, well, you know, I, I always make a joke with trees. I say, well, if the anthropops aren't going to use Rudolf Steiner, I'm going to take him back, you know. So <laughs> thank goodness. So well, so that's why we do May Day and St. John's Day and and Michaelmas and Twelfth Night, and because and it and it's. And, and when you do those kinds of things, you, you can't, I mean, you can't say, you know, you can't say can't because people will always wait for somebody else to do it. Right. Somebody, somebody should do that one of these days. There is no, if you're thinking somebody needs to do that some, one of these days, that's, that's your guardian angel saying, yes, you do. Right. Well, that feels like a heavy charge because I was just going to remind you again that I really want you to write a book about biodynamic farming for middle schoolers and high schoolers. I told my wife about that and she, I have been thinking about it. I, I would love to do it. I just got to think how I would do it. Yeah, I, I would love to do it. Maybe I'll think about what I can do myself. But that voice in me is like, no, he has to do this. Um, that's, a, that's such a, thinking about anthroposophic politics is very depressing. Pressing after having <laughs> after having gone into Catholic politics online, I was like, "Wow!" And then looking at anthroposophic politics, oh, I'm not doing that again. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that word retrieval really stood out to me. Um, Say more again. Regeneration, just taking something and then care, seeing what it goes through and finding what it goes through and uplifting all of that. Um. You know, I, I was taking a few notes while you were talking, but I did think about Joel Salatin. Had you read Folks, The Saint Normal? I know of yes. it, but I have not read Bonnie's it. got it. I've read parts, but she read the whole thing. But And I've watched his videos. He's awesome. He's great. Folks, I The Saint Normal. And it's not normal. You know, when he, I he think. Cuts, he cuts to everything. I mean, he, that anxiety crisis, uh, Mike, that you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. With teenagers i mean he says when you are cutting firewood all day long <laughs> you don't have time to be getting into the same kinds of violence and drugs i mean I'm, there's an argument to be made the other way too but he says you know when he has his teenagers fully working on the farm they're tired they're yeah. exhausted they have so much energy and I think that's what our young people have is they have all this energy and they're not using it. They're just sitting on they're the they're pressing, pressing their fingers and that anxiety is building up in their muscles to the point where it's getting into their brain. And I would love to hear what Steiner had to say about all well, he said, that's why, Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. No, so that's why Steiner, everything with him is the practical work, right? Yeah. And he's got this one verse, seek the practical life, right? You know, um, so when I was, when I was, when I first started as a Walter teacher, I would, in the morning, I was an assistant uh, for a class teacher in the afternoon. I taught gardening, you know, um, and so many kids don't know how to work No, you know, in college kids as well. I mean, when I noticed, when, so when I first started, uh, as a Walter teacher, so it's 1992 or 91, uh, at the same time, I had a landscaping business. We lived in the city at the time. And I would design gardens for people and do stuff. And it was so hard even then to, to get in. And I, I paid pretty well. I was, for the time, it's 10, 10 or 12 bucks an hour. Um, I couldn't find anybody who could work more than a couple hours without <laughs> falling apart, you know? And I think there's yeah. interest there for them, right? You know, that we... I've been subbing for the last couple of weeks in a small little school, um, kind of an impoverished community, but not everybody. But the uh, students nowadays, they're, there's a list of, in every class, those students who just need to, at any given time, they're the students that are allowed to take a lap, right? So they'll just, they'll be in the middle of a class and they have to, they get the opportunity to walk around the whole school. And I get it, right? We all get it. But wouldn't it be neat if that energy was channeled into, you know, we, we're going to have many episodes talking about the schools, but let's work within let's color within the lines here. But couldn't you take that energy? They have gym class, but again, have them working in the soil in some way. Have, you know, um, again, uh, most of school takes place in the late fall and winter. So I'm not trying to beat up on anybody. And I'm sure the idea is out there. 
but it's such a it's an answer to a problem where the lap is a palliative you know but, but it's we're making something with that are you guys familiar with um well Sauter, i mean both of you yeah. how familiar are you with front porch republic oh exceedingly right yeah um, Jeffrey Bilbro gave a talk a few years ago at one of the Front Porch Republic conferences and said that at his former college, not where he's at now, they have these, these uh, photos on the wall showing the sheep and all the things that used to graze on the commons. And it was common, common until a few years ago. And then they stopped it. Mm -hmm. And when they went back to sort of say, hey, let's, you know, this is a, 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 a liberal arts school, but with a history of a strong agricultural program, how can we get this renewed? They were flabbergasted. They had no mm -hmm. idea. They like, <laughs> have these pictures on the wall of the, co like, the college students dealing with the sheep. And they, but once that chain was broken, it was so hard to get any administrator to fathom how to re mm -hmm. renew it because I, all I, the were numbers and insurance and what's going to happen and what do we fence off and what are the credentials and what does the state say? And you were like, oh my gosh, this is such an easy thing. How did we lose this? What else did we lose? I met with the president of Mary Grove College when it was, when it was still, before it went belly up and with, with precisely that kind of uh, proposition, they were putting in like this miniature golf course because they thought they would teach kids in high school to be leaders and leaders play golf. <laughs> this is crazy. I never heard of it. Yeah. And I told them, I said, you know what? You know, so in Tara, Detroit. We can see Tara. This is a podcast. Uh, Tara. <laughs> Tara, ladies and gentlemen, Tara Thiki just threw up in her mouth a little bit. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but so what I heard, but here's the thing though, is with the grounds at that college were beautiful. It looked uh, it looked like a medieval monastery. The, the architecture was just splendid. And and actually I had even built a uh, a Shakespeare garden in honor of my former colleague and teacher, because I was a student there, uh, who, who Maureen de Roche, who'd retired. And so they, they got some money. And, and since she hired me as her gardener when I was a student, I designed a garden for her and, and, uh, and it was beautiful. Of course, it's probably a parking lot now. But at the time, though, I said, you know, and Detroit's got this real kind of renaissance of urban gardening. There are farms in the city on, on old uh, abandoned lots. I said, why don't we do an organic gardening program? You would have, all, there's, a, there's a ready clientele right here. And I, know, and I know all the people you could need to know who could run it, even if, if I didn't run it. I know all kinds of people who are farmers who, who would love a job like that. And they, they just like, like Tara said, they, they were kind of stunned. <laughs> what about what about accreditation? How do we accredit that? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, they were just dumbfounded. Yeah, and we could have had bees there. We could have had chickens there. We could have had goats or sheep. There's really this sort of split in the in the psyche of people who think, okay, let me get my hands dirty. Like you can say, let's, let's do bees. <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, let's do it. And then this sort of mentality where you, where you say something like what we're saying and all of a sudden, all these, what is, what is it that they see? Numbers, charts, publicity, insurance. <laughs> they, well, there's, there's some blockage where they, the joy does not permeate. You know, what works is paradoxical. You can take students to on a service trip, right? And you fly, and I've done a bunch of these, and they're great. And the students come back transformed. But we would go to Biloxi, Mississippi after Katrina. But like that's working with tools. But then they send the school photographer down. This is at the college where I work. You know, and they take a lot of photo ops there, and it looks great. But it's very, it's confined to a foreign place for one week. And it has a lot of publicity associated with that. And I don't mean to belittle like the wonderful uh, people who lead that and everything. But Again, uh, the worst is the corruption of the best, right? In that mm -hmm. sense, you know, when we're talking about that versus having sheep on the college green, right. we're talking about night and day. Well, well what I found is, in, it's, I've been in higher education for a long time, is that there's a lot of talk about innovation and leadership. 
but they only do innovation or leadership if they, somebody else is doing it first. <laughs> so it's neither innovation nor leadership, yeah. but no one wants to make the first move. So funny, so funny. How about this? You know, Tara, I, I see some of your work too, whether it's in Twitter or Substack. Uh, do Right now, just mention the name of your Substack and how people can find it too. Then I want to oh, quote God. from you a little bit, to kind of set you off, kind of singing the song you sing, whether it's in, it's like, it can go here or there. We're kind of focusing on women a little bit, but I have a couple paragraphs from your essay on selling the female body and even a couple quotes later that I, I just kind of want to set you off, but uh, tell people about your Substack or where they can find your writings and things. So my Substack, I chose a very uh, difficult to pronounce and understand. That's phrase. why I asked you to say it. <laughs> It's called Soy de Tasa Ule Sila. Say more about that title. Um, it is an Estonian phrase, uh, the nation of Estonia, very close to St. Petersburg, Russia. I'll say it one more time because it's it's Estonian. Soy de Tasa Ule Sila. And the reason that is the title of my uh, blog, my Substack, is that. It's an Estonian phrase meaning ride softly over the bridge, which was a, a folk legend in my mom's Estonian American community that won the, won the or was second in the most beautiful phrase uh, in any language. Mm. Um, if you guys have read you know, Tolkien, um, Tolkien said the most beautiful phrase in English was cellar door. Mm -hmm. and there was apparently some international language contest in the 1920s or 30s and they decided that Estonian phrase was either the first or second most beautiful phrase in any language mm. huh. I think it is a very That's beautiful, beautiful phrase. Yeah. I like it very much but you know in this in this age of globalism one of my favorite things about it is that it reminds me that as beautiful as it is cellar door is also beautiful and there are beautiful phrases in every language. And I want a world with more beauty, not less. Yeah. I want a garden, not a factory, not a laboratory, but a living place to be, a place where we pursue communion, where each person has their own language to give, each, each group, each home has their own thing to contribute. And we need to listen and pay attention to that. I'm going to put that Beautiful. title in a description of today's podcast. Do you feel like spelling it for people though too, or how would they find your Substack? Well, it has some of the Estonian umlauts and okay, and they can also put your name in there, like uh, Tara. Easy to spell, but T H I E K E. Yes, it's actually. I'm I'm so sorry to um have to correct you. <laughs> like, okay. it, oh, I'm so sorry. It, it's thick. Thick. I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, don't be sorry. Um, I was extremely, speak. extremely shy in school. I would never speak. Uh -huh. And when a substitute teacher would come in, they would say, it's Tara and Tiki. And my, <laughs> entire, my entire class would scream, it's fake. <laughs> and I would just sit there with my head in my hand. <laughs> it sounds like you were shy, but you were good at making friends. They all rose on behalf of you, right? No, oh, I was very shy, but they all knew that my name was Thiek. It's, yeah. it's everybody says Tiki or, or Thiki or Thike. Okay, and they so. can find it. I'm going to read a, a paragraph that hits on the word liberation, but I, I think it's relevant to the, say, today's discussion because we've talked a lot about, you know, um, moving forward is not, you know, going backward. and but the kind of the inverse of that is how so many things that we are made to sound as moving forward aren't necessarily so. And um, so from, from your essay on selling the female body for parts, and this is not at your Substack, but in the American mind, October 19th, 2021, the keyword is liberation that comes up a lot. And this is you writing, liberation from the fields and the spinning wheel led to alienation in the factories. Liberation from one's neighbors and housework led to empty homes, kids shuddered in daycares, and mothers lamenting in their wine mom groups that children are a toxic burden. Each mm. liberation leads to nothing, but further overall misery and enslavement, because each liberation means rejecting the concept of individual responsibility. There's one more paragraph. Liberation from the fields and the spinning wheel led to alienation in the factories. Um, oops, that was the continuation of the other one. I'm so sorry about that. Do you want to kind of use that as a touchstone to kind of riff for a little bit, Sarah. That's what you do so well. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll do my best. You know, this is something I, I'm, I'm struggling with as I 
contemplate George McDonald's redemptive Christianity and Steiner and, and Murdoch, um, I don't believe you can dig the hole and keep digging. Mm. But what happens when you've gone so far? Where, what does redemption look like when you are very deep in the hole? Because I think the, the loom and the spinning wheel and the, the farm and the, and the community are good things but clearly we've left them behind and we've developed an eye consciousness, a very strong personality. And yet that personality is suffering and it's anxious and it's miserable and it's drugging itself. So what does it mean to redeem that personality? Um, you know, I think there are things in the past that are worth preserving. We've, we've liberated and liberated and liber liberated and we just keep seeming to end up more enslaved. Is there anything good here that we can preserve a way through, uh, a way to bring the cross into this situation? And if not, what does it mean to go back? Hmm. These are questions I don't entirely have the answer to. I'm, I'm told over and over again what a technophobe I am. <laughs> um, and I, I'm sensitive to both sides of that. Um, I, I hate you know, LED lights. <laughs> I hate blocking out the stars. What does it mean to live in a world of artificial light? Can we save the bees or do we just go back? I'm, I know that what we have and the path of the Borg is not sustainable. It's not redemptive. Is there any way to take where we are and uplift that? The path of the Borg. Back? Yeah. The path of the Borg. So that, I mean, that takes with uh, to link it to today's essay, because I have a feeling our listeners are going to find today's, you know, that was called Mothering in the Age of the Borg. I, in reading it, I got it, but I wondered if you, you use the phrase, and I'd never heard this before, but to help people unpack it, I'm going to read one sentence, and I won't continue with just reading things, but I'm going to highlight the phrase weaponized outlier. Um, you use it twice. You say the age of the weaponized outlier makes it difficult to discuss breastfeeding or biology or any orientation towards truth, goodness, and beauty rather than power. What do you mean? I'm thinking of college students I work with. In context, they could piece it together, but I think that's a very powerful phrase because it describes so much. The weaponized outlier. It's it's quite a phrase. Um, I don't know if I've gotten that specific two words from anybody. It's something that's been in my heart for many years. Um, it feels like it's something I've I've said, but because I think it's true, I think many people have been touching upon this. I think we all sort of see this as um, a kind of people have 10 fingers, but if one person has 11 fingers, we can't talk about people with 10 fingers. Mm. If somebody can't walk, we can't talk about people having two legs. Um, it's a, it's a tricky topic to talk about if, if you've sort of dealt with that kind of emotional blackmail um, mm. on a, I think some people are so sweet and, and good natured and a little naive that they haven't, when they encounter this, they take it at face value. And if you've encountered someone using this and seen behind it and seen the immense suffering, you don't take it at face value. You see the, the pain and the manipulation and the desperate clinging for some sort of justification. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see going on. Is I, I, I would say it's uh, the thing is it's uh, the, the new iteration of shame culture, right? It's, it's a, it's shame culture with a nicer face, but it's a def it's a shame culture is what it is. Right. You know, um, you know, uh, my oldest son went to high school as an exchange student in, in Japan. And one of the things they do uh, for a kid who's misbehaved is he has to sit in the middle of the, of the schoolyard while everybody else is in school. And he's like basically a dunce cap, right? It's a, so it's a shame culture and you don't want to not bring honor to your school. Um, but in what we see now is these little, <laughs> I wouldn't call them microaggressions, but they're, it's that egregore again, right? It's that, that tap on the shoulder that says, no, that's, we can't do that. And, and what happens though, is it disconnects us from what is real. Yes. 
you know, and but the person wearing the dunce cap is now is yeah. being connected to what's real. Yeah. The person wearing the dunce cap now is the person who kind of uses the standard of 10 fingers, even though yeah. they, they admit there's outliers, you know, but it, they're the ones with the dunce cap, you know, that people have 10 fingers. It takes away your ability and especially for children, your ability to describe reality. Um, you know, working in, in foster care and with people in precarious circumstances, you are told to use language in such a way as to not offend anybody. And I <laughs> very much don't want to offend people, but you get told in sometimes by like a wealthy person, don't use the phrase broken family. Well, when a person comes from these circumstances, rewriting their scenario, their story to be normal is not helpful to them. It's, it's detrimental. They need to be able to identify their loss to heal it. But when you tell people there's been no loss, they can't heal it. But it helps the people who abuse or create the, the problem if they don't have to take responsibility for what's happened. Right. It's, it's, it's a little hard to talk about without wanting to to be too um, specific about scenarios where you've seen it used. It's so well said though, Tara. I hope. Yeah, how about like <laughs> even, even tie that in if you can um, to, if you were, give us a summary of the essay you wrote this morning in your own language here. You know, did you write it over the course of many days? I mean, it's just brilliant, well, but the Borg, wrote, the Borg, yeah, it's really powerful. I wrote it about 30 minutes. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. And That's like, again, you can do more with a tweet than I've ever done. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I was, yeah. you know, I read this beautiful piece from um, a wonderful writer online who I love, Oedipa Mass, and she was talking about what, what femininity is. And I've been thinking, just sort of walking around the house, what is it to be feminine? What is an archetype? I really want to be able to offer this renewed archetype of femininity to people, but not just in the trad contradictory, get your, um, get your veil and put it on way, but in a renewed meaning, and I've been struggling with it. And then I read about the Borg on Picard and how the new Borg queen, it was coming around. And I thought, oh, well, here's an example of the hive mind femininity. And here she is, she's saving lives and the Borg aren't bad anymore. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. We can't even face the, the dark side of the feminine. Mm -hmm. We can't face that. We're, we're abandoning our children. We're, in, we're accepting that there's no such thing as women. And in the meantime, we're uplifting the Borg queen and sort of self-worship of the, the sacrificial sacrifice requiring goddess mm -hmm. and not able to name that. It was a very surreal moment. And I thought about, I, I'm watching some of the old Star Treks with my children and sort of thinking about the old Borg and the Borg nursery. And I just sort of wanted to, to chit chat about it. I don't, I don't think I really had an answer <laughs> except my what? eternal answer. <laughs> no, but you, you, you clarified a lot of things. You read it, Michael. I did read it. And um, well, to me, it, it connect, connected to things I've been thinking about for 20 some years. You know, when I wrote that article on Blade Runner in 2005, um, which is really a, a, an article about transhumanism. And at the time, <laughs> I would talk to my students about transhumanism. I, no, pff, Mr. Martin, that's never going to happen. What are you, crazy? That's, you're just, that's crazy talk. And now, it's not only do people talk about it, now it's welcomed, right? Just like the, the Borg is the good guy now, right? Don't, th don't think this is not is a coincidence. And... Um, and so I've been I've been on a kind of campaign like like Tara for for a while to uh, re recentralize you know the, these uh, what John John Milbank calls gendered biblical uh, ar archetypes right gender typology it's important you know but I and that's why I've written all these books where you know um, the the idea that when God says uh, in Genesis, let us make man on our image, male and female. He, he's speaking to Sophia, right? So that to me that, and I didn't come up with that idea. I got it from uh, Alexander Musburger, who was a Benedictine monk who became an Orthodox uh, Archbishop, I think, in the 1930s in his book, From Dyad to Triad. 
And I th- when I read that, I was like, this is it, right? He's this, he, this is what's going on. God is God. The father is speaking to Sophia and says, let us make man in our image, male and female created he them, which, you know, that might, it doesn't, that's not an outlier because it agrees completely with Proverbs eight when wisdom or Sophia is an accompanying God in the creation as his handmaid, right? As his assistant, as his helper, just like in Luke three, when, uh, when, when, the, when Gabriel greets Mary, she says, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, she, because Sophia is the handmaid of the Lord in Proverbs and the reincarnation or the incarnation of Sophia is the handmaid of the Lord who makes God available to the senses through the incarnation in St. Luke. Uh, and that's why when uh, a year ago, when I, I chose to do the, 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 fifth is it the fifth the fifth uh volume of jesus the imagination on the theme of the of the divine feminine and when i if you see the the cover uh i had actually there's a a german artist she's a graphic artist and she does uh digital collage and her images are beautiful and i found her work and i was just enamored i said i would love to use one of your images for the cover of this and so and i had a five or six that I was thinking about. And the one I settled on, it was because I talked to my wife and my daughter, who was at the, my daughter was at the time pregnant. And uh, they said, you got to pick this one. And the, the one I picked is uh, um, of this, this woman. And it's very subtle. She's holding a crown over her womb. And in, 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 the, in her womb is a fetus. You know, so I don't know if you can see it. There oh, go. there we go. Okay, that yeah. was on your Tara blog. Can see it. Yeah, Tara can see it. Now. On your website, yes. Yeah. Um. So, so, and my daughter and my my wife said you got to pick that one because that is the battle right now. Like, because that reestablishes reality. Reality. You know, it's. As somebody who's entered the Catholic Church and has been going through all these things on publicly on the internet, one of the things I keep coming back to is Steiner's need for spiritual science. I you know I believe in prayer. I would love to talk about monasticism with you guys sometime. <laughs> um, all the different things we need, but I think on a very widespread level, people don't believe that matter has meaning. Matter has meaning, right. And mm-hmm. if they don't believe that, they don't believe the female body has meaning. They don't believe pregnancy has meaning. And when they, even when they, people accept some meaning, it's meaning they're giving to it. It's, mm-hmm. it's completely subjective. They're told that there's no ultimate meaning to it. Um, it's just their feelings. It's, oh, you know, a therapist will tell you, oh, it's good to assign meaning to something, but of a broader shared meaning that's absent. There's no collective myth of the female body. There's no collective myth of pregnancy and Mary and Sophia and regeneration that's absent. I mean, from the earliest science books, you know, I, I see with my children, I, I order science books, used books, and I go through them and, that's it's absent. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm so glad Mike picked for the, for the show's description, the quote from William Blake, all that lives is holy. I mean, that's, that's an, uh, that, that statement undergirds everything we're trying to do here. Yeah. All that lives is holy, you know, and people don't think that, I mean, you yeah. know, I mean, you saw this, especially with the, this outrage about the, the, the potential that Roe v. Wade would be overturned. It's, I mean, it's, that's uh, holiness or the sacredness of life has nothing to do with that, with that conversation. It's, it's about politics and my feelings. What, what does only fans have to have to teach us except that your body's money and what does TikTok mm-hmm. have to teach us except that if you 
are funny or witty or quick enough, you can get a bunch of attention. That's an attention mm-hmm. equals your self-worth. Right. Tara, Tara Thiek says, can we restore motherhood without trapping women alone in suburban lots? Can we renew the home so it is no longer a motel, but the root of stewardship? Can we take our work and production back from the financial institutions, which use those things to justify putting toddlers in care for 10 hours a day? Can we support families and water and soil and animals and life and communities and churches without mechanizing them? Can we have holy days, which are seeds of life rather than frantic, miserable, overscheduled consumption waves? That's classic you, Tara. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I used to look for the, the answer to those questions in politics, third party politics, countercultural politics. Um, it's really a cliche right now, but I think those things start in, in my heart, um, just like Michael's doing on the farm. Um, Michael inspired me to take my kids out to the apple trees and, you know, dump our wassail around. Yeah, it. good. Um, I... There's a collective story that I don't fully understand right now. I'm, I'm tempted to become conspiratorial about it. <laughs> and I, when I think about it, all I can really do is pray um, and hope that we're surrounded by angels. As we may be surrounded by demons, but there are angels and good spirits. <laughs> uh, to think that every single thing we're doing matters. And so yeah. I may not be able to, my vote may not be so important. Um, I'm not saying don't vote, but... I'm just saying that every moment of the day is an opportunity for right. me to try to open a veil in this world for the heavenly to come through. And that's, I mean, the, the witness is in, in, in doing, right? You know, you can't, uh, you can't worry about whether it'll be accepted. What I've, uh, so with the festivals, for instance, um, we started doing them seven years ago when we moved here in, in earnest. So we get enough space. And what happened is uh, during COVID, where at first it was just people were just freaked out. But after a year of that, we did May Day a year ago. And word got out that we were doing this May Day festival. And at the time, like the, the Steiner schools were not doing any festivals because people brought germs or whatever. They wear a mask, have to be vaccinated. <laughs> and 50 people showed up that I didn't know. That's more and than we were, get on average Sunday church. And they were, they were like, thank God this is happening. I mean, you, you know, they were, you could tell there was a hunger for something real and, and, and the craziness from COVID make, made them hunger for it even more that connection and it's not and it's not it was just it, it's such a low-tech thing i mean the technology involved in, in a may day festival is is a pole a pole well a pole that i cut down the day before yeah. um and uh, and ribbons and, and i made a crown and ribbons and and a mandolin and that's it <laughs> you know and and then people you know we have the whole may day things might take half an hour with the pole and with the dance and stuff. Um, but the rest of it is in, is the tools for conviviality, right? And people being real in the moment with other people. And it's, it's always such a um, enriching experience for, for people, uh, you know, and it's not like it's magical or anything. It's, you know, we don't have anything planned. It's not like a program or anything. There's no tour, you know, it's just let's see what happens, but let's mark this the 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 changing of the seasons, you know. And I mean, and I and I th- so I think you know we talked earlier about the connection to the soul, a connection to the cosmos, but you have to have that kind of holistic and healthy connection to other people, in celebrating what needs to be celebrated. You know, and really celebrating too. You know, our twelfth night festival, which is the only one we do inside, is you know it's smaller than the other ones. We can't fit a hundred people in our house, but but we get twenty people, and then we go out to 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 toast the trees. You know, and there's a lot of singing, and we have a bean cake, and 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 what I've noticed is my 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 children 
having grown up with this are totally into it, especially with the younger ones right now. They, you know, once, you know, the day after May Day, they're like, when's, when's the next festival? Right. How long till that? When does that happen? It's, it's funny, just listening to you talk, it's so funny for so many reasons, Michael. Um, one of the projects I started, I've started it twice now, and my, my goal for my 60 days off Twitter is to finish it, is I'm trying to make a calendar of the soul. I'm going to finish Rudolf Steiner's Four Seasons and the Archangels, but I've mapped out like all our different holy days, the ones I want to be celebrating, the quarter days, but also like special family days. And I think that would be just such a beautiful task for young people is to sort of say, what do you imagine what your calendar of the year looks like and how does it map with your families and your friends and how do you find common points? Like, you know, as a kid, my mom always made a big deal out of St. Patrick's Day, even though she wasn't Irish. And to me, that's a really important day and it's on my calendar of mm -hmm. the soul now. Mm -hmm. Like that's the day where I celebrate early spring you know it's not the equinox but it is a special day and there are special things tied into they that. say you can plant your snap peas on saint patrick's day you know there's something there's something for all of these you know connected mm -hmm. to the ground yeah. and that's what i'm trying to to do in my notebook is to sort of gather traditions from places i've lived to places where my my ancestors come from and places where i am now mm -hmm. and sort of make it a living holiday to honor all of those um so I think the, the calendar of the soul is fun. <laughs> and the other thing I was thinking of is that my, I grew up with um, an ex-Catholic dad and a pagan mom. So we used to celebrate May Day as a little kid. And I have ex-boyfriends who were Catholics who they had left the church. They loved, like after, you know, years after we had broken up, they would say, wow, I miss coming to your house for the, the December solstice and jumping over the fire your mom would set up. <laughs> yeah, and I thought, wow, these people have gone to mass for years and they feel nothing towards it. Mm -hmm. But they have this really fond memory of my mom passing out the little dish of salt and, and, and sprinkling it over the fire and everybody jumping. And they have those memories for, for she, we didn't call it St. John's day back then, but you know, for the, for the summer solstice. And I feel this sadness that they felt that way about my mom's paganism, which was itself kind of what I'm trying to do with Catholicism, <laughs> make it live again. But the paganism mm -hmm. was dead. She made it live again. Yeah. And that's, I, and that's, I've, for every years I've noticed that the, the young people in particular, but anybody, I mean, everybody was young once who are attracted to neo-paganism. They're attracted because it's the piece that's missing from their experience with Christianity. You know, and it, the thing is, the, the weird thing is, I mean, the, the tragic thing is, is the way you just describe your mom doing, those are all part of the Christian experience. They were there. For they most there. of history. Yeah. yeah. Until after the Reformation. You know, and gradually it faded away. I've had a lot of formal positions in the church, you know, campus ministry. As a lay person, I had to run the local parish for 11 years. Maybe it was eight years uh, working over at the monastery. But like kind of the, the specialty when I've worked in the institution is, you know, young people and the official kind of Catholic, what you said, Tara, church attendance. But shorthand, and we've unpacked even a lot more here, but it would be to say, unless we can tie the liturgical year to the cosmological realities and to nature, we're dead. You know, we're it's dead. Not. That And it doesn't, it's not a, when we say that we have to do it, none of us are thinking that this is the way to attract numbers. We're all saying it's just the right thing to do. Again, it's, it's a regeneration. It's a restoration. Yeah, it's a regeneration. It's, it's revitalizing. Yeah. You know? I don't And think it's so. not hard. Yeah. It's not, no, true, true Catholicism is a type of universalism, but it uplifts every place. And we've somehow interpreted, interpreted it to mean flattening every place. <laughs> it doesn't have to do that. That's Say not more about flattening. Give an example. You know, you said something <laughs> provocative. Um, well, you can take that in a progressive or a trad, uh, either criticism. Okay. Um, you know, I think the, how do I put, let me, I'm trying to think of the, the least provocative example i can think of um, <laughs> hey this is a this is a free speech zone you can say anything you want Im images of christ you know there's the common yeah. 
criticism um, of Christ is always being portrayed as white and you know, oh, he's black. Well, actually he's Middle Eastern. And I think, oh, well, you know, I love the tradition of Christ in Japan where Christ is Japanese. Right, right. Like, and Mary is Japanese. That's Christ is going to look like us because he's, he's our savior and he should look different in different places. He may have had this particular incarnation that we can all be inspired by, but ultimately it, it should lead us to see Christ in each culture. Amen. And we should paint Christ to look like us. And that's a gift. If we try to say it only looks like us, that's a misinterpretation. Right. Well, this, even Christ didn't even look like himself after the resurrection, right? right. His best friends couldn't recognize right. him. Right. So Very it's good. probably better to be a little plastic in that interpretation, right? And I think, I think it's the same with our saints and our, our church years and our holidays. Um, you know, we see, we see Christmas as Germanic. And inspired by the Germanic pagan holidays, and that's that's good and beautiful. But you know, obviously, the birth of Jesus—if it was in December, it was warm outside, and it sort of leaves the southern hemisphere out. I, I think <laughs> I hate to come back to Steiner so much, but I think he really is trying to reconcile those tensions, yeah. and giving us—if he's not the answer, he's giving us a, a direction to go in. And the modern church has to take that up without trying to just dissolve norms, right? Dissolve all norms. And then when they do that, we're just going to end up the Borg. Well, That's it's not Borg, universe. but boring too, right? It's, a yes, it's false universalism. It's mm -hmm. not real universalism. Yeah. Everybody, everybody's disincarnated. So one thing can be incarnated. Yeah. Christ was incarnated to make all dead men, dead men live. And behold, I'm making all things new, right? You know, uh, uh, otherwise you end up with a with a homily that sounds like an infomercial for Jesus, yeah. right? <laughs> Tara, you've said, uh, and I'm grateful that I think I heard you right that you're willing to be with us on a regular or semi regular basis. Maybe um, like a month from now we can do this again. Oh, I mean, this was so much fun for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. We again, we have so much in common that um, you know. I think the reason I almost kind of jumped in there maybe pulling a wrap is because we know you're going to be with us again. But uh, one way of one thing that's come up a bunch of times uh, with this time together has been, and we're certainly not exclusively this, but one thing we all have in common is marrying something like a Waldorf with Catholic, uh, some Rudolf Steiner, but you know, some of these different neat traditions. How about we propose right here that, you know, the next time we're going to talk about something that has interested us all, maybe a month from now, you know, within the next six weeks, certainly. But uh, specifically on education, right? We'd have a field day, the marriage of uh, what Catholic education could look like. A oh, restore, wow. completely regenerate. Oh, Tara, yeah, she's gonna, <laughs> she's already picturing volumes and volumes, but it's, uh, it's solid. And we could, we could do part one through part 12 of that and go mm -hmm. over a course of a year, right? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Tara, for being with us. Is there anything else you can say about yourself that people can, other places people can find you, find your work? I think just on Substack, I, I wish I could leave you with some noble words of, of guidance, but I am, <laughs> I am trying very hard to, uh, to better myself and to love people and love Christ. And I'm, I'm not sure how worthy I am of listening, being listened to, but um, I wish everybody who's listening now well. I'm, I'm, I'll, then I'll close with some of your words, you know, not conjoined in your article from this morning, but the phrase immense suffering is taking place fact um and then you say when we cannot name flowers or trees perhaps uh it's not so odd that we cannot recognize our bodies right that sums up a lot and that's mm -hmm. a theme we can come back to um so uh tara we look forward to seeing you again thank you so much for your time here um michael we'll we'll be seeing you soon i hope you have a, another good week on the farm i'll be planting uh well i think tomorrow i bought some stuff today most everything's from seed but i tend uh, with my peppers and my um, other nightshades and my tomatoes. I went to a nursery today yeah. and bought some heirlooms and some things that are good for this upstate New York, very clayey soil. You got to worry about uh, rot, late, late season blight and things. So I any know. variety that has the word mountain in it, we know it's been <laughs> designed at Cornell and it can withstand the late season blight. Yeah. I actually, today I had to replace two of my grapevines that got wiped out over the, oh, yeah. the last year. Yeah. So, yeah, so we all got busy weeks ahead. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning into the Regeneration Podcast. We will uh, see you next week.
Uh, Take care. Thanks for joining us. Yep.